This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York with Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. We turn now to immigration news. The Biden administration's asked the Supreme Court to temporarily keep in place Title 42 until after Christmas. The Trump-era pandemic policy has been used to block over 2 million migrants from seeking asylum in the U.S. In a filing Tuesday, the Biden administration asked the top court to allow it to end the policy, but not until at least December 27th, to give border communities more time to prepare for what's expected to be an increase in the number of people seeking refuge in the United States. On Monday, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts temporarily blocked the Biden administration from ending the Title 42 policy, at least for the moment, with a group of U.S. states with Republican attorneys general who want to continue to enforce Title 42. We go now to San Francisco, where we're joined by Julia Neusner, the research and policy attorney with Human Rights First. She helped write a new report titled Human Rights Stain Public Health Farce. The group has tracked over 13,000 reports of murder, torture, kidnapping, rape and other violent attacks attacks on migrants and asylum seekers blocked in or expelled to Mexico under Title 42 since President Biden took office. Julia, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about your findings and the significance of what's taking place right now at the highest court, what's going to happen. Good morning, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so we've been tracking the Title 42 policy under the Biden administration uh, since its inception. And uh, as you said, we've now tracked uh, 13,480 kidnappings and other violent attacks against migrants and asylum seekers stranded in Mexico or expelled uh, under Title 42. And that number is absolutely staggering, and it continues to climb for as long as the, uh, the policy is in progress. We know that migrants um, and asylum seekers who, who are stranded at the border are specifically targeted by uh, organized criminal groups um, and, and even police and state actors for extortion, um, kidnappings and, and other attacks. And this policy has just made it so much worse. Um, and the so uh, as, as you explained, the, um, the Supreme Court has uh, stayed the termination of the policy, and uh, the, the U.S. government um, yesterday submitted its response uh, opposing the um, opposing the stay, but, but requesting uh, additional days to be able to uh, implement to, uh, to be able to prepare for for the lifting of, of Title 42. So we don't know how the court's going to decide on that, but the um, the government did indicate that it has new policies that it's it's planning to implement uh, in preparation. And, Julia, could you talk about the uh, erroneous view that many Americans have that Title 42 has helped to uh, to reduce uh, the migrant, uh, the uh, asylum seekers and migrant flows uh, from uh, along our southern border? Yeah, I, I'm Title 42 has absolutely not had that had that effect at the at the southern border. Uh, what it's um, what it's done is it's prevented people from seeking asylum at ports of entry, which is their illegal right. So people um, previously under U U.S. and uh, international law um, were able to um, present themselves at a port of entry, and uh, if they request protection, um, they'd be taken into U.S. custody and go through um, the asylum process. Um, but Title 42 closes off that avenue to seek protection. So it's forced people to cross between ports of entry, um, and, and 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 kept many just trapped at the border. But um, but we're seeing the numbers of people crossing between ports of entry are much 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 higher than uh, than they were before the the policy was implemented. That's because the same forces that are forcing people um, to leave their homes, uh, uh, organized crime, climate disasters. Uh, um, political persecution. Many of the people arriving are Venezuelan, Nicaraguan, fleeing authoritarian governments, um, and the, and those um, in many cases those those uh, those issues have gotten worse over over the pandemic. So people are still coming, and this policy uh, 
and in, in, in any attempt at a deterrent, at, 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 cru at using cruelty to deter people from coming, um, has been completely ineffective, and uh, and uh, it, it's and it's counterproductive because it encourages repeat entries. That's why um, the, the statistics we hear from Border Patrol and CBP about crossings are are um, are, are very inflated because many of the, many of the people who um, who, the, who they count as individual encounters are in fact people who uh, who has, have attempted to cross many times, but because of this policy, have been expelled right back to Mexico. So, um, and another consequence of these um, rising crossings between ports of entry that Title 42 has forced is that people are um, th these crossings are extremely dangerous. People are for um, need to walk through deserts and, or um, f make their way across very very dangerous rivers often at the mercy of organized criminal groups who control border crossings. Um, and we've seen more uh, deaths of people crossing the border this year than any year since um, the government started tracking the deaths in 1998. So it's, it's been a total disaster. And, and in terms of um, the, the legal situation with uh, Title 42, with Chief Justice Roberts uh, issuing this order, what happens now? Does it go to the a uh, full Supreme Court, or, or how do you see the, the legal unraveling or the resolution of this conflict? So the states, um, the states that sought to intervene in this case, uh, on uh, claiming that the government wasn't adequately representing their interests. Um, again, this was a case uh, initially brought by um, by plaintiffs represented by the ACLU who were impacted by Title Forty Two and. Um, and the the government d has defended the policy, uh, and the um, a district court uh, f found that the policy was illegal and um, and ordered that it end this month. And um, and th the states sought to intervene. They were denied by um, the circuit court and by the appellate court um, because uh, and by, because the 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 request to intervene was was made after final judgment. It was. Um, it was very late, so then, in kind of a last-ditch effort, they went to the Supreme Court and, and sought this stay, and and were um, and and uh, Justice Roberts issued issued this this administrative stay, um, pending briefing by the parties. So, the government, um, as I mentioned earlier, has submitted its brief uh, opposing the um, the the request of of the states who are um, um, seeking to intervene. The states have asked that the court stay the uh, the policy pending its decision on the question of whether the states, um, you know, sh sh should be allowed to intervene, uh, and uh, and the government ha has uh, has has asked that that stay be lifted, but with time to um, to implement uh, some some new policies and prepare for uh, for. The, the lifting of Title 42. Uh, so so they've they've asked until at least um, for at, uh, until at least January uh, December 27th um, for uh, b before that stay will be listed. And, list and we're so, going to follow that, of course. Uh, Julia Newsner, research and policy attorney with Human Rights First. Uh, you mentioned Venezuela, and we're going to look at Venezuela right now. Uh, this all coming as tens of thousands of Venezuelans are trapped in Mexico while trying to reach the United States. In October, the Biden administration expanded Title 42 to turn away Venezuelan asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Venezuela has has faced a years-long economic crisis, in part due to harsh U.S. sanctions. However, U.S.-Venezuelan relations are now shifting. The Biden administration recently moved to ease some sanctions on Venezuela, and the administration gave Chevron the green light to resume oil production in Venezuela. To talk more about these issues and an agreement that's been reached between the United States, the Venezuelan government and the opposition, we're joined by Miguel Tinker Salas, professor at Pomona College in Claremont, California, author of The Enduring Legacy, Oil, Culture and Society in Venezuela, as well as Venezuela, What Everyone Needs to Know. Well, Professor Tinker Salas, welcome back to Democracy Now! What does everyone need to know about what has gotten very little coverage, but maybe because of worsening relationships between the United States and Saudi Arabia and its dependence there, um, the U.S. changing its attitude towards Venezuela and the deal that was just struck? 
Good morning. Um, if only slightly, uh, under General License 41, Chevron has been a, a U.S. company which has been in Venezuela for quite some time, has been allowed to resume production uh, in joint operations with the Venezuelan oil company PDVSA. However, much of that money will go to pay debts that the Venezuelan government has towards Chevron. So, in fact, the Venezuelan government will be receiving very little money about that. Um, what has other also happened is that um, they have targeted $3 billion of Venezuelan reserves abroad uh, in an agreement with the opposition uh, to allow the United Nations to use that money for humanitarian aid within the country. So there are small little cracks that one begins to see in this process, uh, building upon earlier conversations that led to the release of six individuals that have been arrested that worked for the Venezuelan oil company, Citco, and are now returned to the U.S. So there are small steps. But in addition to that, we have to consider that, that two days ago in the U.S. Senate, they passed the Bolivar our act, uh, which prohibits uh, any federal agency from having dealings with the Venezuelan government. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this new uh, United States policy allowing 24,000 Venezuelans to seek asylum. Uh, obviously, the Venezuelan population in the United States is the fastest growing group now among uh, uh, people of Latin American descent. Uh, but the, there are particular requirements here in terms of having not only a valid passport and airfare, but also an economic benefactor in the U.S. Uh, could you talk about this policy and how it came about? Well, this policy came about shortly after the Biden administration in an election eve decision uh, decided to apply Title 42 to Venezuelans and not allow them to seek asylum at the border. It, it proposes something that's largely unattainable, uh, 24,000 people who have valid passports who can request asylum from within Venezuela, where there is no U.S. embassy or consulate, um, that have a plane ticket and have a U.S. economic sponsor. This really favors those individuals with resources. Uh, and actually makes it more difficult for individuals that are at the border for, for whom Title 42 has been applied uh, and therefore makes it uh, much more complicated. And, and for some people, it's highly unattainable. Uh, and in terms of, we, you were talking before about Chevron. Uh, obviously, the United States had imposed heavy sanctions on Venezuela's uh, owned um, uh, or largely owned company here, Citgo. Has that changed at all? What's the situation with Citgo? That, that has not changed at all. In fact, uh, Citgo was handed over to the opposition, uh, so the Venezuelan government has very little uh, a role within Citgo itself. It operates in the U.S. So in that sense, there has been very little that's changed over the term of the sanctions. The sanctions continue to grip the Venezuelan economy. As we know, sanctions have not worked anywhere. They haven't worked in Iran. They haven't worked in Cuba. They increase the suffering uh, for the ordinary Venezuelan people. And that's, that's what's really tragic about both the immigration policy and the application of Title 42 to Venezuelans and continued sanctions in Venezuela as well. And I wanted to you ask you, Professor but, Tinker Salas, about the agreement. Um, we talked about the U.S. and uh, and Venezuela, but this Mexico City agreement between um, the government of Maduro and uh, the opposition, led by Juan Guaido, um, marking well, the resumption of long stalled negotiations between them. What has been brokered? Well, what's been brokered is in that, that the negotiations will resume. It's unlikely they'll take place this year. Uh, but there's another problem, and that problem is that Guaido's term in office uh, is set to expire. With the new year comes a new, a new assembly leadership. Um, and what you have right now in Venezuela is a, is a major a potential split within the unified opposition, the G4, um, over whether Guaido should continue or not. So there's a small faction that argues that Guaido should continue as a so-called interim president of the National Assembly and, therefore, the one that was recognized by the Trump administration, uh, and others that say that that policy has failed uh, and that we need new leadership in the opposition uh, and that, therefore, there is a split right now between several parties over what will be the character of the opposition uh, going forward, particularly going forward into negotiations. And I wanted to ask you, in terms of the, those who are coming from Venezuela, it's obviously a long trek through the uh, through uh, all of Central America up into Mexico. Uh, what uh, uh, 
who do you what's your sense of who is actually coming uh, uh, from Venezuela, from what sectors of the population, uh, and how are they are they being treated differently at all from other migrants from or asylum seekers from uh, Central America? I think that's a very good question, because, yes, there is several layers here to unpack. One is that many Venezuelans had originally traveled to Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, uh, Chile, where they faced xenophobia, uh, they faced anti-Venezuelan reaction, um, and they began to move back uh, north again. Uh, another way joined them as well, coming out of Venezuela, um, and they began to trek through the Darien Strait. Uh, the key thing to understand is, what they, is that that—, that Path had already been established earlier by Haitians and by Cubans who migrated to the U.S. several years ago, utilizing the same path through the Darien Straits, through Central America, through Mexico. Um, so we have a variety of forces that are that are moving this migration northward. Um, there are new individuals coming out of Venezuela. Not all are uh, economically confronting situations of, of dire straits. Uh, others are, in fact small merchants, others have funds, to get across the Darien Straits. And the key thing here is that, that that route has been mapped. It was mapped by the Haitians. It was mapped by the Cubans. It has an infrastructure. So Venezuelans joined that movement going north through that trek um, and then crossed Central America and got to Mexico. The problem when they arrived to the U.S. was that they experienced uh, the, the same experience that the Cubans of 1980 in Mariel experienced. Here we have new Venezuelans coming, many of them people of color, many of them working class, um, and, and they confronted a reaction um, that they didn't expect from Vene other Venezuelans who saw them as uh, somehow not the, uh, worthy of the same treatment. Um, they were a lower socioeconomic class. Uh, they were bochornosos, they were uh, rabble-rousers, um, and, and they confronted a reaction that they had not expected. So that they, they have two, con two conditions they confronted. One was the Title 42 being applied to them and not being requested, not being allowed to request asylum. And the other was a, a reaction from the existing Venezuelan community that uh, saw them with suspicion, going to the point of saying that they were sent by Maduro uh, to destabilize uh, the Venezuelan diaspora and destabilize the U.S. We want to end with a clip from a Venezuelan who attempted to make it to the United States. In the jungle, many died next to me, drowned, etc. Many brought their pets, such as dogs, from home. I would give some advice to all these people. Migrating is not easy. If it's difficult, per se, imagine if you do it with children. More than once, you put your life at risk in the jungle. Miguel Tinkercelas, if you'd like to comment for the last 30 seconds. I think that what he said was exactly true. We've interviewed individuals like that. We have an article in La Jornada last week we called The Venezuelan Exodus with Luis Duno, my co-author, uh, and we document that trek. Uh, and the immigrants are creating their own immigrant culture through social media and, and exposing the realities along that trek and at the U.S.-Mexican border. And we should hear their voices uh, in this context. Miguel Tinker Salas is a professor at Pomona College in Claremont, California, author of The Enduring Legacy, Oil, Culture and Society in Venezuela, and Venezuela, What Everyone Needs to Know.